Hello, this is going to be part six of the seven part series for chapter two. This will actually finish off the, the book part, the actual chapter of the part seven is going to be a little extra um, regarding cantilevers. So in this section, we're going to talk about hardness testing, fatigue testing, creep, impact, surface roughness versus fatigue. So we talked a little bit about hardness uh, a few weeks ago. Um, this should be a review. Most of this is a review for you. But we'll go into it into some detail here. And we'll give some examples of where hardness is used. So it's defined as the resistance to permanent indentation. So basically, if you remember, we push a, a steel ball or it could be a diamond tipped. Um, tool into a material and then we see how far in it goes and how large the diameter is under certain load conditions. So the question here, which is common to um, exams and whatnot, is the hardness number, is it fundamental property of the material? So if I give you a hardness number HBD200 or something like that, is that a fundamental property of the material? What do you think, true or false? I'll give you a couple seconds to pause your video. You can think about it, or you can just move along. So it's false, right? It's, it's, um, it's the resistance to permanent indentation, but it depends, the hardness number itself depends on how you do the test. So what type of indenter do you use? What's the shape of the indenter and what's the load that you're applying. So there's different classifications of hardness. So this is a really nice slide. This is something you should um, either print out or have access to during any exam that you might do or even put it in a notebook somewhere so that you know you can refer back to it in your other classes, especially for example materials. So there's a couple different types of tests that were developed over the years. The first one was the Brunel test. H B is what they usually call it, HB and then a number. Um, you have the Vickers, which is HV. You have the Noop, which is HK, because it's with a K. And then you have Rockwell. Rockwell is probably the most used um, system, and that, that would be HR. Okay, so you can see the abbreviations on the right side here. I hope you can see my my cursor. I'll put it on laser pointer. Okay, so HB stands for Brunel, HV stands for Vickers, HK stands for Noop, and then you have HRA, C, D, HRB, F, G, and HRE. And the differences are the type of indenter. So here is a diamond cone for the HRA, C, and D. And then you have a steel ball. Okay, and it's either a sixteenth of an inch or an eighth of an inch. Okay, so the eighth of an inch one was with a hundred kilogram load is an HRE. Now you might be a little bit confused, and we'll talk about this in a few slides. A load is usually a force, and here you're seeing mass units. So you have to multiply by 9.81 uh, meters per second squared to get the force. Okay, so I I kind of not like this. I don't like this um, table for that reason because I label this as a load, but it's actually a mass that you put on top or you're pushing down on with that amount of mass. Okay, so it's not really a force as we're used to seeing. Okay, and then here's a close-up of what the, the material would look like after you've done your indentation with a hardness test. So you can see from the side view how the grains are, are reforming and slipping to um, adjust to that new pressure that's put on there. So this is how the, the permanent indentation looks. Okay. So the Brunel test in this case is a 10 millimeter steel or tungsten carbide ball. You want something harder than what you're testing. Okay, so that's why a lot of times I use diamond because that's one of the hardest materials that you can have. Okay, and D, big D is the diameter of the ball, little d is the diameter of the dent. And that depends on how much load you put on there. 
okay so um, you would calculate it by taking twice the load and divide by this number which includes the big diameter of the steel ball the indenter itself and the little diameter which is the actual dent that you make okay so you might want to practice that and we'll go through a problem that goes through um, a calculation and applies it to another um, element okay so there's a great example in the book okay and it talks about um, you know putting a load on um, and then calculating um, the HB value so you know if you look at this P is the load in Newton's so a 500 kilogram load for example would have to be multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity so then you would convert it over into Newtons and then the diameter is often given in millimeters which is um, you know um, there's a thousand millimeters in a in a meter so you have to convert meters millimeter squared to um, meter squared okay so example 2.2 in the book I, I refer you to that you should read through that and try to do this example I'm gonna step through it here so what they talk about is is you're given um, a piece of steel that's found to have a Brunel hardness and HB hardness of 300 okay you want to estimate the elastic portion of the stress strain curve um, to the yield point and this is called resilience so this is a common um, property that people use when designing um, mechanical structures so um, a rule of thumb that's often used for determining resilience is that the yield strength is one-third of the HB hardness so if you do a hardness test you can kind of do a rule of thumb calculation to determine what the equivalent HB hardness is and vice versa so the first step is, is you want to come up with the yield strength that's when you go from an elastic to a plastic region if you remember that's when the when the material yields so that's usually in in megapascals and then you want to find the modulus of resilience after you find that yield strength so this will become more apparent in the following slides so first we're going to calculate the yield strength and remember the rule of thumb you take the HB um, uh, hardness test number and you divide by three and that should give you something close to the yield strength okay so we we were told it's 300 kilograms um, the hardness test came up with 300 kilograms and we're going to divide per millimeter squared and we're going to divide that by um, three and then we have to convert it to megapascals so you can either divide by three and then convert or convert and then divide by three so you want to get it to newtons per meter squared so here's a step-by-step -step procedure okay so we went through the first step okay we did the estimate of what the yield would be based on the HB hardness okay and then we have to multiply by 9.81 meters per second squared and then we have to convert millimeters into meters so that's a thousand millimeters right per per meter so that's equivalent to multiplying by one right and you square this okay so you come up with this big number here nine eighty one zero 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 okay well that looks like nine eighty one times ten to the six and ten to the six is mega okay so we're real close to megapascals aren't we so a kilogram meter per second squared is a Newton right and we've already converted the denominator that was an area unit of millimeter squared to an area unit of meter squared so that way we can convert to 981 megapascals okay so go through this slide you may get a either a quiz question on this or a test question that's similar to this one okay so now we want to find out the modulus of resilience um, this is you know this concept here needs you to think it over a little bit you need to think this over so the modulus of resilience is equivalent to this area this pink area under the straight part of the um, stress strain curve 
Okay, so we look at the straight part of the stress strain curve. That's where it's in the elastic region. Okay, so we go up to the yield strength. That's when it starts becoming plastic. That's the S sub Y that we talked about in these equations. Okay, so we draw a line across and then we come straight down. Okay, and there's a point C in the strain, right? I labeled it C, some arbitrary n number. Okay, so if you take C times S sub Y, you would get the total area of this rectangle. And you have to divide it by two to get the area of the pink part because it's a right triangle, All right? So think about it, it's half, a, half of a rectangle. Okay, so the area is equal to SY times C divided by two. Okay, when I first was playing with this, I forgot about dividing it by two. <laughs> All right, so that's pretty straightforward. So the area is the, the um, yield strength, S sub Y, times C divided by 2. So what's C? Well, C you can rewrite, okay, right here. If you remember what the definition of the um, elastic modulus is, E, it's equal to S sub Y over over C, so that's rise, right, rise, and then the run is C. So that's the slope of this curve, right? It's Hooke's Law. This is basically Hooke's Law. So you go E equals S sub Y over C. Well, you can rewrite C, right, and solve for C, and then you get S Y over E. Okay, S sub Y over E. So if we take S sub Y over E, substitute it in for this C here, <coughs> right here, okay, we get S sub Y squared over 2E. So I'm filling in the blanks that aren't in the example in the book, because they go from one step to the next, and you might not quite understand what's in between there. So I'm giving that to you, okay? So now you got S squared over 2E. And that's the area under the curve. So if you want to calculate the modulus of resilience, you would use S squared over 2E. Okay, and, and we, we um, estimated the value of S sub Y based on the hardness test, the HB value. And the rule of thumb is if you have an HB value, you divide it by 3 and you'll get, the, um, you'll get an estimate of the um, yield okay the yield strength and then if you take the that estimate the yield strength squared divide by twice the um, elastic modulus you'll get the resilience okay because you're finding the area and you can look up the the um, modulus the elastic modulus of steel okay and it ranges so if you know exactly what steel you have you can go look it up and in, in this example they say it's 210 gigapascals. Now that's giga. We were dealing with mega before. So giga is 10 to the ninth. Okay, mega is 10 to the sixth. So make sure you use the right exponents. A lot of you have got some problems wrong in the past because you weren't, you weren't tracking your, your units. And that's so important. And I'm hoping they're drilling that into your head not just in your engineering courses, but in, in your chemistry and physics courses as well. So units are real important. Okay, so if we plug and chug all of this, okay, we get a number. So we put 981, which we already found, right, to be the estimate of the yield stress. And then we divide by 2E, okay, and if you do the math here, you'll get something that looks like 2.29 joules per meter cubed. So modulus of resiliency is usually given in joules per meter cubed. So I want you to go through this. This is Newton's per meter squared on top, squared, right? Because it's megapascals. So mega, a, a pascal is a Newton per meter squared. So now you get Newton squared per meter squared on the top. And on the bottom, you just get a Newton per meter squared. So you end up with a Newton per meter squared, and, and you can rewrite it as a joule per meter cubed. Okay? And that, that's the preferred way of writing down modulus of resili resiliency. 
it's it's also if you do the math it's it's also a pressure unit okay all right so um, in an exam I might say you know what's the modulus of resiliency in joules per meter cubed okay and then you'll have to type it into um, into the multiple choice answers and it has to match all right so we're back to this original slide where you have the Brunel, the Vickers, the Noop, and the Rockwell standards. You should go through and plug and chug um, numbers into this to get get some uh, hardness numbers out. Okay. So with the HRA, you know, at 60 kilograms, that means you're using the HRA. Um, the number you get is 100 minus 500 T. Okay, so T is the depth of using the diamond cone tip. And there's a really nice um, video um, which talks about that. I think we refer to it in a couple of slides. Okay, so you would apply a certain load onto your hardness tester, right? Release the load and then you would look at the depth of the dent in, in the... Um, in the material and from that you can tell um, you know what the hardness value is so the lower the number okay um, means that it's gone deeper right if, if you have if you go twice as deep it's going to be a smaller number than if you go not as much so that's the way you look at it is you know the for a given amount of um, load I'm only going to go so deep. If I go and then I do another sample and if for the same load I go deeper, that means the second sam sample is not as hard. It's softer. Okay, so the lower the number, okay, that means the deeper you've gone and the softer it is. Right? So if you don't make any dent at all and T is zero, then it's more than 100, right? So that's then you'd have to if you did the HRA test and you didn't get it to dent at all, then you'd move to the HRC test or maybe the HRD test, one of those two, until you get a dent in it, and then you'd say, oh, it's an HRD and have a certain number. That's why they have these different loads here. You can do the same thing with the steel ball, okay? And that would be an HRB, an HRF, and an HRG. So if the problem on the exam or on the homework says, you know, what is the hardness in HRF, right? Um, you know, and it went so deep, you'd be able to do it. And then it might, we might ask, if you do an HRF, what load would that be equivalent to? And you just look in the chart, okay? So anyway, you get the right, you get the idea. So the difference between the Brunel testing is you're looking at the diameter of the of the dent, and the and the Rockwell you're looking at the depth. And if you can do geometry, you know this is 120 degrees here. You can also look at the size of the dent, and you know how deep it's gone. Right. So it's either or. You can do the simple geometric math. So these are three videos. Um, I'm not going to play them here for you now. There are YouTube videos, so you can go ahead and, and find these yourself. And you can also click on them in the learning um, module on Learn. And you can also just you know copy it and, and paste it into, um, into YouTube and find these uh, videos. And I really recommend you watch all three because that'll give you an idea how these things work. And when you're in the materials lab later on, you'll be doing these kind of tests. All right, so, um, and you can also just click on it for the PDF version of the, of the lecture slides. Okay, so highly recommend you watch these. This is a nice comparison. It's pretty close to being perfect, right? It's, it's kind of, giving you an idea if you measure you know a certain value on the HB so if you look at the bottom it says what um, what test you're using so this is the HB test so if you look at tin for example right it's really soft we all know that tin and lead are very very soft 
you can use your fingernail and dent it. Okay, so these numbers are very, very low. So you, you would use an HB or an HV test, okay, to determine um, the hardness of tin, okay, or lead. If you tried to use an HRB test, you, you would go right through the sample because the load's too high. It's way too soft, okay? And then, of course, as you go up, right, you get all the way up to diamond. That's the hardest on this scale. There might be some weird materials that are harder than diamond, but typically, I think diamond's considered the hardest or definitely one of the hardest materials that we're aware of. Okay, and then, you know, we have everything in between here. So we use diamond to scratch glass, right? A lot of times they'll, they'll try to scratch um, something that supposedly is made out of diamond. They'll try to do a scratch test with the diamond, and if it scratches it, then it's softer than diamond. So Krubic zirconia might be a little bit softer than diamond. Glass definitely is, okay? Um, titanium is, carbide is really hard. Boron carbide, um, cubic boron nitride is really hard. Sometimes these are used as coatings, some of these materials, okay? But you get an idea. So if it's a 300 HB, it's gonna be a little bit more than a 300 HB. It's gonna be about 68 on the HRA scale. It's gonna be, uh, what, about 105 or something on the HRB. You get the idea, so you can come across and, and guesstimate at what range values you'd get if you use the different type of um, um, test, hardness test. Okay, so what test would you use for tin? Well, probably an HB or an HV. And then for diamond, you know, you could use, you could use an HB test, but you'd have to put a huge load on it, right? Um, it's really, really hard to get get any kind of a dent, um, but you might use uh, an HK, for example. Um, an HRB, HRA, HV, all of those tests wouldn't work, okay, with determining the hardness of diamond. All right, so we talked about hardness. So hardness can give you an idea um, a quick idea how good the material is and then from that information you can get an estimate of what the yield strength is okay and and that sort of thing so what's fatigue hardness is like uh, we push on something that dents okay and then if you remember um, ultimate tensile strength and um, yield strength that was you pull on it and you pull on the material and when it starts to go plastic, then you know you've hit the yield strength, okay? And then when it starts to neck and curve over, right, on the engineering stress strain curve, when it starts to curve over, then you've hit ultimate tensile strength. And that's when it starts to neck. So you know something about the material already. But let's say you want to use this material and you're going to make a spring in a car, okay? Or use it as part of a structure in an airplane wing and it vibrates, it, it, it flexes while it's flying, right? If you ever watch the end of a plane wing, you can see the plane is bouncing on the wing, right? And the wings are flexing up and down. Okay, so what happens over time when you flex a piece of metal back and forth, back and forth, back and forth? You can keep bending it, bending it, bending it, bending it, bending it, and it finally breaks. That's called fatigue. Okay, so when we do it with a piece of metal, to break a piece of metal, um, a metal that's kind of soft, right, and we can bend it by our hand, you, you bend it like a, like a spoon. You could do it with a spoon. If you bend it enough times, you'll eventually break it. Uh, and we've done that with coat hangers and things like that. If we wanted to break the metal, we'll just keep bending it till it fatigues and breaks. Okay, but we can do scientific testing on fatigue. And so if I'm going to build a structure and I want it to last a long time and it's under vibration, I'm going to have to do fatigue testing on the material in order to pick the right material so that it will withstand um, the fatigue or the vibration over a long period of time. So it depends on the application. 
if you get 10,000 bends over the lifespan of the device that you're designing, then you might want to um, design it to be good to 100,000, a factor of 10, a large factor of safety. Um, if it's something that vibrates really fast, a lot, right? Like part of a speaker maybe in your speakers. So you might do, you know, 10 kilohertz or 20 kilohertz if it's a tweeter in your speaker. Um, you might want that to last, you know, a million cycles or 10 million cycles or 100 million cycles. You know, how long are you going to play music on your speaker? It's, you know, I want it to last 10 years. Uh, you know, and assume you're going to use it four hours a day and you can kind of do the math and figure out how many cycles it's got to withstand if you're doing 20 kilohertz, for example, right? So the little parts inside of the tweeter has to last that long. So, you know, depends on your application. It depends on your design. So um, eventually, though, it'll break, right? if you let it run long enough. So this is this is a set of videos um, that talks about fatigue testing. And if you look at it on a scanning electron microscope, you can start to see these little fatigue striations forming. You know, if you bend something of one or two or, or let's say 10 or 100 times, they'll start to get these little striations inside the material until finally a crack forms and then the crack propagates and breaks. Usually once the crack starts to form and gets to a certain length, then it goes quickly. It'll fail rather quickly after that. So a lot of times on airplane and, um, airplane parts that are subject to fatigue failure over time, they will um, analyze the metal and see if there's any micro cracks. And once micro cracks start to form, then they have to do some mitigation to get those cracks to stop so that the plane doesn't come apart in the air. Okay, so they use ultrasound for that. So if you use a high frequency sound and you have a crack that forms, some of that um, sound wave will reflect off of the crack and they can actually image for cracks. It's kind of like imaging, you know, when, when you're having a baby or something, right? They use ultrasonic systems and they send a sound wave in they look at the reflection and then from that reflection they can build up a um, picture of what's going on inside okay so again fatigue is like you're going to keep repeating a stress okay on your material so you'll have a peak stress and usually they do a sine wave so you get a peak stress and then it comes down and then it's a negative peak stress and then comes up a positive peak stress so they'll usually use a sine wave with a certain frequency and they'll keep um adding you know, they'll keep doing that over and over and over again until it fails and that's fatigue testing so here is an example what they call an s versus n curve so S is applied stress. So I'm going to apply stress of a certain amount. You know, let's say 100 megapascals. Okay, and then I'm going to release the stress. Then I'm going to apply it again and release it and apply it and release it and apply it and release it. Okay, so if I do 100 megapascals, um, newtons per, well, this is newtons per millimeter squared. I think that's megapascals. Okay, so if I apply 100 megapascals, right, um, I'm trying to, these 3D plots are kind of confusing here. Uh, if I come across straight, I think I'm going to inter interface or cross over here. I won't give you a 3D plot if you have to interpret the data, um, but you come across and then you intersect with the line and then you come down and you know how many cycles you did. So this is the applied stress, 100. I come across and I come down. It lasts a million cycles. So let me go ahead and turn this into a pen. Okay, so we come straight across and then we come straight down. Not very straight. Okay, so just eyeballing it. I mean, it's a better straight line. 
Okay, so it's going to look something like like this. Okay. So if I apply a stress of a hundred megapascals, okay, and then I wait for the the widget to break. So you can do it on a rod. Some of the videos show a rod and they pull on the rod at a certain frequency and a certain stress level and they wait for it to break. Okay, so you know, in this case, in this example, it broke at a million cycles. Okay, and that might be good enough for whatever application you're using, or it might not be. It depends on the frequency that you know your device is running at. Okay, so this is what they call an SN curve. It's it's showing you how long it takes for something to fatigue and fail, and that goes with the number of cycles. So I can run it at a higher frequency so I can get the results of the test quicker. You know, if I do a low frequency, for example, in a plane, that flexing frequency might be, you know, 100 hertz or 10 hertz, somewhere in that order. Well, if you ran this thing at 10 hertz, it would take a long time to get to a million, right? So you might run the test at 100,000 hertz or or a thousand Hertz or something like that and a Hertz is a cycle per second it's a frequency how many times you're gonna flex this thing in a certain amount of time per second would be the Hertz okay so you get the idea there alright so it's a logarithmic graph right you have linear no you have a log log here so again it's like the natural uh, way things work it's usually some kind of log relationship. So here's another example of an SN curve. Okay, um, so you have a low cycle fatigue and you have a high cycle fatigue. So let's let's look at this a little bit closer. I'm gonna apply this sinusoidal wave that's depicted up in the upper right here. Okay, and we have a stress amplitude. Okay, and that's from the average up to the top, okay, and then down to usually stress minimum is negative, or it could be zero, right? But you have a certain stress amplitude, okay, and that's from the median to the peak. So the overall at, 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 um, stress range is from peak to peak, okay, and the mean stress is, of course, you take the uh, the max plus the min divide by two. So the mean could be zero. Okay, so they'll either stress it pushing and pulling, or they'll just pull on it, bring it back to zero, pull on it, bring it back to zero. Okay. All right, so we have a stress amplitude, and we set that up in our tester. How hard do we want to pull on this thing? So that would be a point somewhere on the stress um stress curve here so in this case it's a stress range so if our range is high if we're going to put a lot of stress on it, it's going to be up here okay and you can imagine you're going to run it for so many cycles and then it's going to break so in this case if we start here and go across and then come down we're going to be something like 8 times 10 to the third okay 8 times 10 to the third is 8,000 cycles well if my application is something that's very slow moving, that might be good enough. If it's a higher frequency application, it ain't going to be good enough. Okay, so you want to make sure your stress range is low compared, right, to the number of cycles you need. So if I need 10 to the 5th cycles, okay, I'm not going to want to design something where the stress range is going to be higher than this point here. Okay, and if I want a factor of safety of 10 or something like that, right, I really, you know, I'm shooting for 10 to the 5th, but I want it to last 10 to the 6th to have a factor of safety, then my stress range is going to be a little bit lower. And how do you lower the stress range? Then, well, you make a thicker device, right, because stress is, is force divided by area. 
load divided by area. So you know how much load your system has to be able to withstand. Okay, so you make your beam or your spring flexure with a bigger cross-sectional area. And then you can reduce the stress range. Okay, and when you do that, you make your spring thicker, it's going to last longer. The fatigue, the high cycle fatigue is going to be at a higher point. So that's how this curve is interpreted. And this will give you information on how to design something. Okay, so here's some sample fatigue SN curves taken out of the book. On the left side are metals. Okay, so there's two metals here. You have the 1045 steel and then the 2014 T6 aluminum alloy. And again, we're doing stress amplitude now. So how much are we, what's the max we're going to pull on it? And then we'll release it, pull on it, release it, pull on it. And then at some point it's going to break. So if we're up here, you know, in the 460 range, we're only going to be able to do this 10,000 times to 100,000 times, somewhere in between there, right? Um, but what you do is you, you apply this stress amplitude curve, this sine curve, where you're going through a maximum and a minimum stress and, and you cycle back and forth. Um, and you do it at a certain frequency with a certain stress amplitude or stress range. And then if you look at the data over time, you see that if you have a very high um, stress amplitude, that means the peak of this um, sinusoidal wave is a lot higher. Okay, you're going to be up here. And your system's going to fail early, right? Earlier, I should say. So, you know, somewhere between 10 to the 4th and 10 to the 5th cycles. Okay, now if your stress amplitude is low, right? And I'm trying to draw it in the upper right corner here. So if you have a low stress amplitude, okay, say you're down here somewhere, you know, let's say at 300 or so, you come across to the steel curve, and you're going to hit this endurance limit. So basically what that's saying, it's going to stay, you're going to be able to cycle for a long time before it fails, right? And, and so that gives you an idea of, of how these things work. So the lower, the lower the stress amplitude, the longer your widget's going to last under continuous um, varying stress. Okay, and that's important um, when you're designing things that are going to get or be exposed to different types of stress or different levels of stress and it can be repeated stress or it could be something that's a little more chaotic but you're going to get an idea of how long your your um, design is going to last so remember this is stress amplitude i can't stress this enough right so what is stress amplitude and stress stress is force divided by area. So as a designer, you may not be able to choose your material, right? You might have to use some material that's been, um, for example, that's been qualified by building codes, if you're doing a building, or by the um, Department of Transportation, if you're doing vehicles or perhaps aircraft or drones or something like that. So you're going to only have a, a little bit of a selection of materials. So what do you have control over as a designer, right? The forces you can't control because those forces are going to be determined by how this um, component that you're designing is going to be applied. So those forces aren't going to change. You can't really change the forces. Now, you can change the geometry. This is where your design capabilities come into play. So you can change that area. So if you need to to be able to go to a million cycles, right, to be safe, you're doing an airplane or a drone or something, then you're going to have to make sure your stress amplitude is 300 or less for this type of steel. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, I can't change the forces on this part of the, the widget, but I can change the area. Right? If I make the area bigger, make it slightly thicker, 
or change its shape somehow so the effective cross-sectional area is different, honeycomb, shape, something like that, then all of a sudden you can get the stress amplitude lower and make that part last longer, okay? So those are the concepts you need to understand. All right, now here's a cool example. I'm into microsystems and microelectromechanical systems, and we'll have some lectures on that shortly in the next few weeks. Um, so I, I know a little bit about making things that are small. And we use photolithography techniques and a different type of fabrication methods than what you're used to doing in the uh, machine shop, for example. In the machine shop, you start with a piece of metal and then you shape it by removing material till you get the shape you want. In, in semiconductors and in microsystems technology, you transfer patterns onto materials and then you remove what you don't want on there by etching or you lift away what you don't want by liftoff processes and there's some other processes you can use as well. So here's an example of a very small structure so I want to explain this for you. This here you see these little teeth right In, and they're and they're opposite from each other they're like a comb so if you can see my fingers right it's a comb Okay, so if I put a positive voltage on this part of the comb, right, and then I have an opposing um, comb that I put negative charges on, right, opposites attract, so you got a positive and a negative, so this thing's going to want to bend down, right, and be attracted, so it's going to pull it in. So this whole thing here, okay, is going to move in that direction. Okay, so I can turn the voltage on and turn it off. Now this part right in here, I'm going to change the color and hopefully it will make it easier to understand what I'm talking about. Let's do green. So if you look closely here, there's this notch. And this is a common structure in mechanical engineering to put some kind of a notch in there. So this is what the notch is right here. This is a close-up of it. Okay, so when this whole thing moves, right, it twists or rotates, goes like this. We turn the voltage on, it pulls it over, and then we let go of the voltage and there's a spring. It's going to want to go back, so it's going to go back in this direction. It's going to go back when I let go. And then I turn the voltage back on and it's going to go this way again or this way on the close-up you're going to start stressing this point here. So this little notch is intended to be a stress point so you can study fatigue. Okay, so you can run this electrostatic comb drive. That's what it's called, electrostatic comb drive. There's no current flowing. We're just turning the voltage on and off. That's why it's electrostatic, static electricity. It, 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 it um, attracts, opposites attract. So you turn the static on and off is one way to look at it. And you can do that with a sine wave, right? Just like you saw in the other um, slide. This is a very bad sine wave. And instead of a, a stress amplitude, you have a voltage, right? And the stress you're putting on this system is proportional to the voltage. So I can turn the voltage up, or I can turn the voltage down, or I can run it at a higher speed. Typically they pick one voltage, and then they run it for a long period of time at different frequencies. So you can do this for a long time, and then you find out when it breaks. And then you can do fatigue testing on it, on that structure. So this is the actual um, stress amplitude versus N curve right, the S and N curve for that micro device you just saw. So they calculate what the stress amplitude is, and you can do that using math, and you know, um, you know the, the thickness of that material that's actually polycrystalline silicon. It's probably on the order of one or two microns. Oh, it's two microns, that's what it says here. Whoops, right, it's two microns thick. Okay, and if I go back to the previous slide, uh, I don't have a scale on this thing, but I would imagine this is probably on the order of 5 microns or 10 microns, something like that. So that's this distance here. 
is on the order of a of a um, a um, red blood cell. I know these fingers here are typically about one to th three microns wide, so I can kind of eyeball it. Okay. And these devices were made at Sandia National Labs and tested because they wanted to understand the material properties of polycrystalline silicon, the mechanical properties. Okay, so they did a stress life curve for two micron thick polysilicon at 40 kilohertz, okay, in air. So there's some resistance factor, right, some damping coefficient in it. Um, they can also do it in vacuum. But in their test facility, it was easier to do it in the air. And, and they would run these things at 40 kilohertz and, you know, at this stress level and wait for it to fail. Okay. And at this stress level, this stress, this stress amplitude, this stress amplitude, this stress amplitude. And you can see there's noise in the data because not everything is going to fail at the exact same time. It's not super repeatable. But you get a cluster, and the cluster follows, you know, a general downward trend. This dotted line here, okay. And you can see as I reduce the stress amplitude, okay, which is corresponding to the voltage that I'm applying to this thing. I'm not doing a good job. Um, right we can we can do those calculations and then we run it at 40 kilohertz and we count how long it takes to die to break and then we plot our point and then we do another experiment at a different um, stress amplitude or voltage and we wait for it to break and then another one we wait for it to break and then we slowly build up this curve and you can see there there is scatter in the data right so when you're making devices, you want to know when it's going to break, plus or minus something, right? And then you want to stay away from that region so that your device will last practically forever, okay? So the question here is apply this graph to an actual problem you may have. So, you know, I got all this data from my technician, and I'm an engineer, and I want to know how long will it take to break if I run it at three um, gigapascals, you know, if I run it at 40 kilohertz. How long does it take to break? And so you go, okay, 40 kilohertz, that's 40 times 10 to the third, okay? So you have 40 times 10 to the third. Man, I'm having a hard time. Um, cycles per second. Okay, I'm doing um, 40 kilohertz, and then I look at my, my three, and I'm gonna switch to another color. Uh, red's good, it shows up, so I go, okay, I have three, I'm gonna go across. Well, it could fail here, but I'm gonna go with this dotted line here, where the average is, and then I'm gonna come straight down. And this is something, if I eyeball it, you know, let's just use a nice round number. This is 10 to the eighth cycles. Maybe it's even four times 10 to the eighth. We'll keep it simple, right? So if you look at this, this could be a four down here, all right? So we get four to, times 10 to the eighth cycles. That's cycles, right? Hertz, cycles. Number of cycles, not hertz. That's cycles per second. And we're doing it at 40. Okay, times 10 to the third, that's kilo, hertz, cycles, I'm gonna abbreviate it, per second. So look what happens, right? The cycles cancel out, the per second on the bottom becomes seconds on the top, and that gives you the time. So this would be the same as saying four times 10 to the fourth, right? Underneath, 4 times 10 to the 8th, so you go 8 minus 4, because when you do exponents, you subtract. So then you get 1, right? The 4s cancel out. You get 1 times 10 to the 4th. So it's going to take 1 times 10 to the 4th seconds, okay, which is, what, 10,000 seconds? So if you have 60 seconds per hour, or 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour, you can convert to hours, okay? 
And so if I had to do a back of the envelope calculations, it's something like 3,600 seconds in an hour. You can do the math and you'll get some number. I don't know, I think it's around 30 hours or something like that, okay? Um, but you do the math and, and check it. Okay, so here is, is another, um, another um, question related to this. Um, what part of the stress strain curve do you think, you know, what part of the stress strain curve are A and B related to? And how are they related to each other? So is A the elastic region or is B the elastic region? What do you think? And I'll let you think about it for a while. So remember, this might help you. You know, we have the straight part of the stress strain curve and then we have where it yields and then it starts to be plastic. And then when it bends over until it finally breaks, this is stress and strain. This is UTS ultimate tensile strength. This is where it yields, okay? So that's that's related to the stress amplitude, right? The stress value on the y-axis, okay? So back to the question. A, top part of the, um, of the elastic region and B is the lower part of the elastic region or is it the other way around? Well, the higher the stress, the higher you are on the elastic curve. So this is the top part of the elastic region. And this, this is the lower part, B, where you have less stress amplitude. And notice, the lower you go on the stress amplitude, the longer it's going to last under cycling. We're cycling down here, okay? Repeated stresses. All right, so we talked about uh, fatigue. Okay, now there's another quality that you might want to look at is called endurance. So you can imagine that at some point when you're doing your um, fatigue testing, um, so you're changing, remember, you're changing the stress amplitude as a function of time, um, or the amplitude of the stress, and then you're counting the number of cycles until it fails. So you can get to a point where your stress amplitude doesn't make a difference anymore and this thing will last for forever, right? You lower the stress amplitude to a point, it'll last forever. That's the endurance limit divided by the tensile strength. You can categorize different materials, okay? So titanium has the best endurance divided by tensile strength. So what does that mean? Well, here's the tensile strength, okay? And what was endurance again? Okay, that's um, when it starts, you know, when it starts to last a long time at what stress amplitude? That's the endurance limit. Okay, so, you know, in this case for steel, it's around 300 or something. If I take that 300, and I divide by steel's ultimate tensile strength, right, I'm going to get a number that's around 0.5. Okay? So that's halfway up. Boom. Halfway up this curve. So if this was steel, at this point here, that's my endurance limit. Because I know the endurance limit divided by tensile strength is about 0.5 for steel. Now if I want a better endurance, divided by tensile strength, I would get titanium. So that's 0.6. So that means we can go a little bit further up on the stress strain curve before we run into problems. So, you know, titanium is used, titanium alloys is used in airplanes a lot. It might be part of the reason. It's also lighter material, okay? So you can pick materials too, um, if you have that choice as a designer to meet your endurance divided by tensile strength um, criteria. So here's another example where we talk about fatigue. Um, and that has to do with the digital mirror device. So if you're not familiar with it, the DMD is, is um, the core element for watching digital movies and movie theaters now. Okay, so it's an array of pixels, array of mechanical mirrors 
and here's a, a small ver you know a small subset of it they look like Cheez-Its okay these, this is an actual scanning electron microscope photograph of a DMD chip okay and this is a generated model right using something like SolidWorks so you can see that these these mirrors can flex actually they tilt they go back and forth back and forth okay so these turn on and off these flex thousands of times per second when you go watch a movie in the movie theater and every time it flex or it it um, tilts it tilts towards the mirror or towards the lens the mirror tilts towards the lens and puts a pixel of light out through the lens which is projected on your um, movie theater screen and if you turn it on more than off um, in a second you know you do it thousands of times per second if it's on you know say 2,000 times and it's off the other 10,000 times it's going to be a lower intensity pixel and then if you turn it on 12,000 times in a second and don't turn it off you know um, then you're going to get a very bright pixel so you can get a wide contrast range and then the color of the pixel determines is determined by what color of light lands on the mirror at the time you turn it on so you can have red green blue red green blue cycle through on the mirrors and then you can mix it mix it up at different ratios of turning on and off and you can get you know trillions of colors um, color variations of course your eye can't perceive that many colors but it's a very rich um, um, user experience and Texas Instruments makes these arrays they developed the technology in the 90s I think they came out around 95 96 with the first DMD chips of maybe SVG um, quality which is 600,000 or 800,000 mirrors um, turning on and off several thousand times per second and it's an electromechanical system okay so these things, needless to say, they, they turn on and off thousands of times per second, and it's basically done um, with the post. So the post, which you don't see, is where this little divot is. It's actually a post that goes down and connects up in the middle of this spring here. This, there's a spring that runs across. It's a flexure spring, so you've got a post sitting on a flexure spring and it can twist back and forth so if it twists one way it goes towards the lens and it shines out a um, a bright pixel and then if you get it to tilt the other way then it shines away from the the lens to a heat absorbing um, element inside the projection system okay so you you can turn it on and off that way but that flexible spring is put under fatigue right it you you put some stress on it and then you let it go put stress on it let it go stress on it let it go and you do that over and over and over again um, you'll get so many cycles and after a while it may fail so Texas Instruments had to do fatigue testing on this device because they wanted to know how long their chip will last in a projection system so the first projection systems are like the projection systems you see in classrooms, the little projectors you see sitting on the desk or hanging from the ceiling. Some of them are LCD based and some of them are digital mirror device based. The ones in the theater are all digital mirror device. Okay. Anyway. DLP technology is based on an optical semiconductor called the digital micro mirror device or DMD. The DMD chip is an extremely precise light switch that enables light to be modulated digitally. It does this with a rectangular array of microscopic mirrors that corresponds to light in a projected image. Coordinated with a digital signal, a light source, and a projection lens, these mirrors can reproduce video and graphics with incredible fidelity. When a digital video or graphic signal enters the DLP system, it activates a tiny electrode beneath each DMD mirror, causing that mirror to tilt either toward or away from a light source. When a mirror is tilted toward the light source, it reflects a single white pixel through a projection lens and onto a screen. Tilted away from the light, the mirror is switched off and its corresponding pixel space is dark. Each DMD mirror can be switched on and off thousands of times per second. 
Varying the amounts of time a mirror spends on and off causes it to reflect different shades of gray. When a mirror is switched on more than off, it reflects a light gray pixel. And when a mirror is switched off more than on, it reflects a dark gray pixel. In this way, the DMD mirrors can reflect up to 1,024 shades of gray to create a highly detailed grayscale image. The last step in digital light processing is transforming monochrome images into color. In most DLP systems, color is added by placing a light filter called a color wheel between the light source and the DMD mirror panel. As the color wheel spins, it causes red, green, and blue light to fall on the DMD micro mirrors. When the on and off states of each mirror are coordinated with these flashes of colored light, a DLP projection system can create more than 16 million different colors. For example, a purple pixel is created by tilting the mirror toward the light source only when red or blue light is falling on it. Our eyes then combine the primary colors to see the intended purple. And due to the flexibility of this innovative color wheel, manufacturers using DLP technology can alter the color wheel's design to add four, five, six, or more colors to achieve a wide range of effects on screen. DLP televisions, home theater systems, and multimedia projectors use a single DMD system consisting of a DLP chip, a lamp, a color wheel, and a projection lens. These systems are famous for producing video and graphics that are sharp and clear with rich, vibrant colors. In movie theaters and large venues, a three-chip system enables even greater fidelity and brightness. In a three-chip DLP system, white light from a lamp passes through a prism that divides it into red, green, and blue. Each DLP chip is dedicated to one of these three colors. The colored light that they reflect is combined and passed through a projection lens to form a single pixel on the screen. DLP cinema systems can project no fewer than 35 trillion colors for a movie experience unlike any other. From the movie theater to your living room to the boardroom, DLP technology is revolutionizing the way we see projected images and setting new standards in picture quality. The video showed how they work, right? So you can see that the that they flex. They're on a spring that flexes all the time. So that that needs to be fatigue tested. So what Texas Instruments did was they took many of these chips and they ran them um, under under a certain um, frequency, and they could run all the 600,000 or so mirrors on one device at the same time. So they can turn them all on and off at the same time, and then they would check to see if they still work. And it's easy to tell if they don't work. They're either stuck on, so the pixel's always white, or they're stuck off and the pixel's always black. Okay, so um, they, would, they would do these tests at four to eight times the normal frequency, and then they'd run it until the thing breaks, one of the pixels break. So they were doing this uh, fatigue testing and they found they went out to 3.6 trillion cycles on a mirror and it still wouldn't break. Okay, so if you convert that into hours, runtime hours, that's about 69,000 hours, <laughs> which is a long time. So the equivalent lifetime of the system, because you're not running a day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, you're gonna use this projector in the case of a classroom, maybe three to five hours a day, and in the, you know, five days a week, in the case of a movie theater, probably close to the same. So, you know, you, you, know, you can convert that to an equivalent lifetime of 250,000 hours. So, um, Basically, they last a long time. I got to see their little museum on the DMD chip and the DLD, DLP processors um, they have at um, Texas Instruments. I think I was out there in about 2005, 2006 time frame. Um, we did a tour as part of my grant work. And they had a chip in there that had been running for 15 years. And that was one of their first chips that they successfully made that functioned and it still worked so they showed it running the, the little lights went on and off and that and that sort of thing and it was a very small array but it just shows you that the materials 
at that scale, see, that's the other thing. If you go down to a very small scale, right, things behave a little bit differently than at the large scale. So here's a log or a blog link on here where they talk about this. They have a little presentation. Okay, and, you know, they had problems with stiction. Occasionally the mirror would get stuck, and it wasn't about failing the fatigue testing. It was about stiction. So the mirror would actually stick to this pad underneath, um, or this pad underneath. And remember, the mirror post is actually, um, let me get a, a pen again. The mirror post actually connects with the yoke underneath it where this red circle is, okay? And then this is the spring that flexes. And this part will go down and then the spring will make it snap back up and then this part will go down. So on, off. And these pads here provide an electrostatic charge, either positive or, or, or grounded, that causes the metal mirror, because it's made out of aluminum, to get attracted to the pad and then when you turn the voltage off it snaps back okay but they had a problem with these things sticking staying stuck down so they created these little tabs here which are little springs so when it hits it, the spring hits and then pushes back up again and it reduced the stiction okay so that's that's a problem they had with surface adhesion so they, they have hundreds of thousands of normal operating conditions. It lasts for freaking ever. It doesn't fail. Um, the first few um, runs of the chips back in the mid-90s, you know, you would buy a chip and it would be cheaper if one, one of the, you know, 100,000 million chips or mirrors didn't work. Um, so you get a cheaper price. And a lot of people didn't mind that. So you would buy... You know, a projector it had one or two pixels that didn't work on it, but you'd pay fifty dollars less for the projector, or hundred dollars less. So people didn't didn't mind paying less for one or two bad pixels. Um, but then they got to the point where ninety six to ninety eight percent of the chips worked, which means that a hundred percent of the mirrors worked on those chips. So you can do the math. That's really hard to do. Make make a few million devices and they all work, right? And they're all part of one package. So you get an idea. The, the hinge fatigue lifetime was greater than 3.67 trillion cycles, or 250,000 hours of use. And it was robust in the environment. Um, so, you know, they actually would seal these chips off with a glass plate. Uh, this is a really good review if you're interested in more about fatigue testing and materials testing and whatnot. Um, this is a, a fellow who's a sales guy, a sales engineer, um, who's giving a webinar on his products. And he talks about fatigue life and how the testing is done. And, um, you know, I would highly recommend watching this if instead of watching Game of Thrones or something like that, you spend an hour watching this. It'll help you understand fatigue testing and it might give you an idea for a possible career path as a test engineer, right? And making the devices that people buy to test their products. There's a big market for that too, test equipment. All right, so what's what causes a fatigue failure? Because you say, well, you know, why doesn't it break after one cycle? Why does it finally break after a million cycles or 10 million or a billion cycles? You know, what causes it to break at all, right? So, and then what can I do as an engineer to delay that failure and make it fail not so early on? Because if you remember the curves, you had a spread of failures, right? So it could be 10 to the 6th all the way out to 10 to the 8th. And so there's a range that it could fail at for a certain material um, and a certain stress amplitude. How do I improve on, upon that? Well, if you think about it, you know, most of these failures start as a defect on the surface, right? And then, then that defect starts to grow. So you get micro cracks and the micro cracks start to grow out. 
and eventually it becomes a big crack and fails. So surface roughness is one thing you can reduce, right? If you make your surface a lot smoother, if it's going to go under a lot of vibrational um, fatigue type of um, environment, if you make a very smooth surface, um, you can extend the life and extend the fatigue testing failures, right, to a later time. So this is a reminder of what, what surface roughness is. It's a number. You can actually quantify it. Uh, it gives you an, uh, an idea of what the average variation is on the surface. So you can measure surface roughness or machines that do that and give you a number. Okay. And then you can look at surface roughness as a function of fatigue failure. So this is what we've got here. So on the bottom scale there is the uh, number of cycles on the, on the x-axis and on the y-axis is the stress amplitude in megapascals. Okay, so you can see if my surface roughness, it's the black one here, the black box, here it's 0.4, and remember it's it's the average roughness. So here we're saying it's very smooth. I can go all the way up to a stress amplitude of 550 megapascals, and run it, you know, a few times, you know, maybe a thousand, ten thousand, something like that, and then it fails. But these other surface roughnesses, I can't get up here. It fails way before it even starts. Maybe on the first or second cycle. Okay, and then the less you know, this surface roughness isn't quite as good as the black box. So if we look at this, we can see, oh, okay. You know, it's a little better than the blue ones. At least we had one or two tests that were further. It's a bigger spread. Okay, and here the average is slightly to the right of the blue ones. Remember, the right is smoother than the blue. And then as you get down to these stress amplitudes, which are lower on the stress strain curve, right in the elastic more towards the elastic region you start to see more of a spreading so now the black ones are moving to the right compared to the blue okay so if you look at the very smooth versus the rougher surface you can definitely see there's a difference in fatigue um, failure okay and then as we go to even lower stress amplitude we start to spread out even more it's kind of interesting that you've got some of the red ones even to the right of the black. So it looks like, you know, if I had to guess the difference between a 0.8 and a 0.4 on the surface roughness doesn't affect the fatigue as much. But if you go to 1.6, then it starts to make a big difference. So you can start to have, you know, very long fatigue lifetimes if it's very smooth and your stress amplitude is low okay so there's a I think we have a new professor that actually studied surface roughness versus fatigue as part of his PhD in his research well I can't remember which one which professor it was so that's fatigue so fatigue is, is I'm gonna cycle 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 a material and eventually it'll break and it depends on the stress amplitude, okay, and then the number of cycles when it breaks. Now we can do something called creep. Creep is when I just put a load on something and I watch how it deforms over time. And typically they, they do this using something like a tensile tester, but they actually heat the, heat the material up. Okay, because creep doesn't really happen if things are at room temperature too much. Usually creep occurs at high temperatures. So they would do these sorts of tests for materials that are going into engines or into rocket engines, right? Like the, like the um, SpaceX um, engine. I forgot what they called it. Dragon engine? Or is that the... No, the dragon is the rocket. I don't remember. But anyway... You know, you'd have to test your materials under temperature, so they make they put a furnace around your sample, and then you can see they have it under a constant load, right? So you got a pulley system here or a fulcrum with dead weights on it, so you know exactly the force that you're pulling on this thing or the stress, 
and you can increase the stress by adding more weights just like in a in a weight room okay and so you're going to look at how this thing stretches over time okay so it might take a while for you to fail right so here's time on the x-axis and then this is how much it moves okay strain so I'm going to put a weight on it and it's going to get longer and longer and longer and then it gets to you know this this deformation happens right away and then over time it starts to stretch more and more and that's the primary time region okay and then it continues to stretch but at a much lower rate and then it starts to get into this tertiary region and it starts to strain faster again and finally it breaks okay and this curve will change depending on of course the material and also depending on how much stress you put on it okay for for that material and so you'll get a series of curves and it'll look different for different materials as well so make sure you know the difference between fatigue and creep. Remember fatigue is with a um, varying um, stress. So you have a stress amplitude over time and it's usually a sine wave. And creep is I just put a weight on it and watch it stretch over time. Okay, and I can do it under temperature as well. And they do fatigue testing under temperature because if you have a part inside of an engine that's at a high temperature, you're gonna to wanna to see how that reacts. Um, and with fatigue and engines, you know, you get a lot of vibration. All right, so we did, we did tensile testing this chapter and then fatigue and creep and barrel <coughs> and several, several different types of testing. There's one more, I think one more left in this chapter and that's impact testing. So that's real important because a lot of things, you know, you want to know what happens when you impact it, a car hitting a brick wall. Or hitting another car that's an impact right you get a lot of force over a short period of time okay so that's an impact force okay and, and so it's it's dependent on force and time so it's an amount of energy that this thing has to absorb in a very small amount of time so impact testing is, is something that you will do in materials class and we have one of these okay so it's basically a simple thing. You have a you have a pendulum with a certain weight on it. It's called a hammer. What's on the end of it? So it's like a hammer. Then you let go of it, right, from a certain height, right? MGA and that the energy this thing has is MGH, mass times gravity times the height. That's the potential energy of this hammer. So when it when this pendulum swings down, and hits the specimen, it's taken all of this potential energy, turned it into kinetic energy, and then it hits that specimen. Well, it breaks. This is designed as a, as a failure test, right? So it breaks it, and so the energy that's absorbed by the specimen, okay, is taken away from the pendulum, and the potent pendulum keeps moving, but it only goes, to a lower height, right, than what it started with. So this difference in height gives you an idea how much energy it took to break the specimen. So I drop it from up here, right, it swings down, it hits the specimen, and it only goes part of the way back up. And then I can look at that difference in height and I know the mass of the pendulum, I know what gravity is, so I can determine the change in the energy, and then I can get an idea of how much impact the specimen can take. And the specimen is usually a standard type of bar with a notch in it, that's a standard notch, okay? And then you hit it at the notch, or slightly above the notch, and that's where the the breakage will occur is where the notch is so it starts breaking at the notch so it, the notch just just um, focuses where the impact is and then you can get repeatable um, results so you have the izod version and the sharpie version and you can look them up i think there's some videos that i refer to as well 
I would highly recommend you watch the video and then you'll understand better how it works. Okay, so that's what this video is. It's a five minute video. Okay, so you start at zero, right? And then you drop it down and it goes to a certain level. Okay, um, and then you look at the difference and you know how much energy you put into it. Okay, so this is again a cartoon how it works. You start at this starting position and then it comes down and around, hits the specimen and only comes part of the way up. So you have the initial height, the final height, you take the difference between the two heights, multiply by mg, right? And you get the total um, energy that went into the specimen. So if the uh, specimen, you know, is tougher, can take a higher impact, um, this height will be smaller. If it's a really flimsy kind of specimen, a very easily breakable material, then little energy will, will be taken from the uh, pendulum and it'll end up higher up. So the less strength there is, the higher up it goes. Right, and if you don't have a specimen, it'll go all the way back up to the original height, which is this height here, but on the other side, okay? And you calibrate it for the friction of the pendulum. And that's the end of part six. So I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I didn't wasn't too long-winded and, um, and you learned something, but you can always, you know, watch 10 minutes, stop it, go have coffee and watch another 10 minutes. All right, thank you and have a great day.